Our reading tonight comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm going to start it at verse 20. And Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, and it's the second to the last chapter. He's wrapping it up, and he's, he's ending with a bang on the resurrection. He says this, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. This is the word of the Lord. So, as many of you know, we're going through the Nicene Creed. We've called a series The Mystery of God, or Revealed the Mystery of God. And uh, we're at that section of I believe in the resurrection, or I believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, ascended, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. That's a lot to cover in one sermon. So I'm going to aim for hitting the resurrection tonight. We've got next Sunday at our neighborhood tables, maybe to unpack the ascension and the seating, which are also very, very, very important. Um, Anna, two weeks ago, she took us through Philippians 2, and she covered the she got the downer section of the suffered, died, and buried, and then I saved for myself, of course, the, the much more positive, resurrected, ascended, and seated. So uh, we're going to look at that tonight. Now, um, I, uh, I was circling back to our Corinthians um, series that we did uh, four, four or five years ago now. We went through all of 1 Corinthians, and it was right before, it was the year before the pandemic hit, and, um, and I was going back through some of our notes there, and I wanted to go back to that because Paul hits on a lot of these themes, and especially he hits on resurrection in a huge way at the end of 1 Corinthians. So I'm coming back. I wanted to look at through the lens of, um, of that series that we did. Now, I'm going to start off with a little picture. This is the line to get into the summit of Mount Everest. Okay? It's crowded. Why? Why are people doing this? This is nuts. I know for a fact, and from personal experience, that there are less crowded mountains you can climb. (laughs) Huh? And the hordes aren't climbing this mountain. There's plenty of room, or any other mountain in this city, Lots of room, no lineups, plenty of parking. Okay? (laughs) Climbers climb Mount Everest because they're seeking something beyond the limits of what it means to be human. Roland Smith put it this way, for a climber, saying that you're stopping by Everest is like saying that you're stopping by to see God. Anatoly Bukreev, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, he's an Everest guide, put it this way, and I appreciate his perspective, mountains are not stadiums where I satisfy my ambition to achieve. They are the cathedrals where I practice my religion. And we can define transcendent as going beyond the limits, the ordinary limits, surpassing, exceeding, Maybe having a new experience. What do we need to do or to have in order to have what is considered a transcendent experience? And why do we need one? Or if we don't need it, why do we want it so badly? Have you ever thought about this? Why does there seem to be this human drive to transcend the limits of our own existence? Do you have this? Do you feel this? 17 climbers have either died or gone missing this year on Everest. And this was last spring, so this was the, when the, for the new season there. 
And it's a record. Deadliest year in Everest's history. And reasons for the death toll continue to center around overcrowding. There's just too many people. People are literally dying for this experience. A lot of us can ascribe a certain feeling of transcendence to all sorts of different experiences. You don't have to go to Everest. Anything that can kind of replace the old, the ordinary, what we're used to. For some of us, it can be pretty simple. It can be shopping for clothes. It could be getting some new technology. Maybe a new book from the bookstore with that new book smell. I like that one. We can fill up our lives with stuff because it gives our brains this little endorphin boost. We possess a new thing, and so in some ways, we're kind of new, too. But it can also range to the more relationally complicated, like the idea of a new sexual experience, say, or the decision to get married and have children. These are experiences that can take us outside of ourselves into something that's bigger than us, transcends, yeah? Or the feeling that you're not comfortable in your own body and you want to change it. Whether it's through exercise, whether it's through diet, or even a transition from one gender to another. These are all experiences that transcend the old with the new. Could be moving to a new city. Could be buying a new home. Could be starting a new career. The list can go on and on. We are creatures constantly craving to transcend the limits that we currently have. But what are we trying to transcend? What are we loathing so much in our lives that we can't bear to stay the same? Is it boredom? Insignificance? Pain, maybe? Maybe the fear of irrelevance? Or the fear of death? The meaninglessness of it all? There's some sort of desire in us that says, I need to be better. I need to be something different than what I am. Might this be pointing to something larger? Where does this feeling come from? Is it something that's ingrained, seems to be ingrained in the human genetic code or somewhere in our spiritual makeup? A lot of us are familiar with Genesis 2 and 3 because we remember the creation of Adam and Eve. We remember the paradise garden. The problem with that one tree. But the problem with the Genesis 2 and 3 story is that it's so symbolically saturated and so rich that it holds a whole lot of meaning. You can go over and over and over it again and again. You can see more every time. So here's something, a helpful image from the Bible Project showing the worldview of Genesis 2 and 3. So up at the top there, you in the brighter spot, you have the domain of God and the Elohim in the Bible, spiritual beings. And then down below, you have the domain of the created world, humanity and the rest of creation. Eden is that meeting point between the two. Humans can't go into the domain of the spiritual beings except where those two worlds kind of overlap and collide. So in Genesis 2, that's Eden. Um, in other parts of the Bible, that's the temple, which is also symbolically, um, at least at its resting point in Zion, in Jerusalem, it's on a mountaintop. Okay? These are symbols. Jesus went and prayed on mountains. It just Again, it felt like a transcendent experience, right? We know that God isn't really up there, but it's a symbol that helps us think of getting outside of our own space and into the space of the other. But what if, so these are the, these are the two domains, but what if the two places, what if God always intended for humanity to participate in that spiritual world? To walk in the presence of God? to transcend the created world in this way, to have that experience, might it answer our constant discontent and drive for these new experiences? I think it does. I think it does. I think this part of the point of Genesis 2 and 3 is to show us what we were made for in this way. 
The biblical world has a lot of explaining power for us. It can help us understand why we feel the way we feel sometimes and why we act the way we act sometimes. But we live in a time and place that has flattened all of reality into what happened between birth and death. And even here, only the things that you can measure. And it's a little bit depressing compared to what we were just talking about. This means we can take a perfectly good thing like stuff, and it is good, or mountain climbing, or marriage, or having children, or owning a home, and we can invest them with a meaning larger than they can possibly contain. We place a burden on our marriage, or our sexual partner, or a new transformed body, that it can never hope to the support. None of those things could. A spouse, a friend, a child, a career, whatever that thing is. Because it wasn't made to support that weight, you see. If we could invest ourselves into the biblical worldview, it could take some of the pressure off those other good things that we have that we get to enjoy in this lifetime. We were never meant to be fully satisfied by mere creation. We were always made for more, way more than this, and anything that this can provide. And if we could enter into that space, that worldview, then we would be free to be married or to be single with joy and contentment. Without making that career or that person or that thing into the thing that will transform me and save me and make me new. But we know the Genesis story. Most of us, Adam, Messed it up. Adam and Eve together, they messed it up. We can't get there. And this is where we meet up with Paul's words in his letter to the Corinthians. And he says this, guess what? Remember how that first Adam failed and messed everything up for the rest of us? Well, there's a second Adam. That's right, there's another Adam. It just means human representative. There's another human representative that has come and he's providing new access to the deepest longings of our hearts and our minds and our imaginations, what we were made for. He's covering that gap. So here's the thing. Remember the realm of the spiritual beings. You can't actually get there with your current bodies. That's the problem. You need new bodies that can access and engage that realm. We need new bodies. This is important because a lot of Christians have a non-bodily view of the afterlife. And this is where we, or those Christians that have that view, overlap with Paul's audience. A lot of the Corinthians in the Greco-Roman world had the same view. They sort of had a spiritual view of the afterlife without the senses. So it's kind of drab and not that exciting of a prospect. But Paul is pointing something beyond what even Adam and Eve had. And maybe it was hinted at in the tree of life in that garden. But Paul is pointing us to a body transformation in 1 Corinthians 15. This is why Paul makes such a big deal out of Christ being the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruits was the first harvest of a crop, or the first little bit of it. It was the promise of the rest, the full that was to come later in the season. Paul is saying is that Jesus, his resurrection, is that promise. It's the first of many. His resurrection from the dead is the sign and the promise of a future resurrection for those who belong to him. That's verse 23. And it reminds us, like, oh yeah, if you read through the Gospels, Jesus rose from the dead in a body. He wasn't a disembodied spirit. He ate bread, he ate fish with his disciples, 
They could touch him. They could feel where the wounds were. But there was also something different about his body, wasn't there? Do you remember that? He could pass through walls. He didn't seem to be bound by physicality in quite the same way. So a body, yes, but also a new kind of body. One of Paul's main points in all of 1 Corinthians is this. You're not going to achieve the transcendence that you want, the transcendence that you were made for here in your earthly body, not in full. So stop looking for it here. Stop putting all your needs on others or on institutions or on stuff or on big, great ideas. I don't know about you, but I feel a tremendous sense of freedom when I think about this. It means that that longing in me, that ache, is for something greater and better, it's supposed to be there. It belongs there. It's not a bad thing. It's okay. It's actually a sign of health. And there's nothing that I can do to fully quench it in this lifetime. There's something counterintuitively helpful about knowing that. It's a good sign and something that I can learn to be at home with. And it points to something that God promises will be fully quenched in the end as we wait for it, as we long for it. And in a way, that longing, that feeling, is evidence of the fulfillment that is yet to come. That we're not finished yet. This is something that Paul had to convince his Corinthians here. It's like the resurrection, the big one, hasn't happened yet. And all the things that we're tempted to place the burden of our deep need for transformation and transcendence on, they can be relieved of that burden. Food, community, relationships, stuff, whatever it is. They can be things that point to the greater transformation that will happen at the end. And they can be points of celebration and of anticipation. Appetizers. We can hold them before God in this way as gifts to be received, and images of greater things to come. So, you can still go to Mount Everest if you want to, but please be careful. Be amazed at the beauty and the terror and what it points to about divine things and the deeper pull of your life. But know that it will not satisfy you in that way, not in the deepest ways that you need. This is the promise held out by the resurrected Jesus, the empty tomb, the one who has conquered death. And when those of us who follow him are raised with new bodies, then we will achieve the transformation and transcendence that we have always longed for. And this is where Paul essentially ends his letter to the Corinthians with an encouragement that also stands for us. Don't be moved. You don't have to be worried about getting the ultimate experience or transcendence that you need because God is the one, the only one who can give it to you. You don't need to make your life decisions out of fear or anxiety that you're missing out on the greatest thing ever. The good shepherd knows what you need, and he knows how to give it to you. You pray with me. Would you glorify your name in our midst tonight as we pray, as we sing, as we hear your words, as we celebrate at the table? Would you awaken in us or affirm in us that longing to be made new, to be transformed, to be caught up with you in your glory and your goodness and your beauty, all the things that our souls ache for. And would you free us, Lord, 
teach us to not place that burden on anything else in our life. That you are the only one who can carry it. And it's your pleasure to carry it for us and to fulfill it in us. We love you and thank you and we bless you and we look forward. We look forward to the resurrection of which yours is the first fruits. In Jesus' name, amen.